and I'm the president of Rosho Christi at Rutgers. I would like to thank, first of all, Rutgers University for giving us the opportunity to host an event like this. Rosho Christi is a student Christian apologetics group that equips university students and faculty to give historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus Christ. We have weekly meetings where we wrestle with ideas relating to the intellectual credibility of Christianity by encouraging dialogue and stimulating discussion. Everyone is welcome to attend, engage in the conversation, and ask questions that, are concerned, uh, that they are concerned about in a friendly environment. You can check out our free material over on the tables at the back. Ratio Christi at Rutgers meets weekly, weekly on Monday nights at 9 p.m. in the Rutgers Student Center atrium conference room. All right, next we would like to acknowledge our sponsors for Ethics Week. The Chuck Colson Center for uh, Christian Worldview, which you just saw the video from, is committed to building and resourcing a movement of people living and defending the Christian worldview. Through websites, online news, and radio programs, the Colson Center applies solid thinking to the key ideas of the day. Find out more at colsoncenter.org. Alliance Defending Freedom is an organization working to keep the door open for religious freedom by transforming the legal system and advocating for religious liberty, the sanctity of life, and marriage in the family. Find more about them at alliancedefendingfreedom.org. <clears throat> also, ISI would like to acknowledge for the support of this uh, meeting here. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute works to instill an understanding and appreciation of America's founding principles. They host seminars, publish several journals and magazines, all in the service of educating the next generation in the principles of liberty. Uh, some of you on your chairs will see cards that you can fill out about ISI. If you then take that to the table outside in the back at the end, you can get a chance to win one of the books that they're raffling away. Also, the table for Ryan Anderson and Keeley is over on the side where you can get information about the Heritage Foundation. All right, now onto our topic. Why is ethics so important? Nearly every major discipline will interact with ethics, the branch of philosophy dealing with right and wrong behavior. Whether it concerns religion, behavior, science, business, and work life, family life, or medicine, these subjects cannot be isolated from ethics. However, in today's world, we have arrived at a period where a with a disharmony of voices, each claiming their own truth. We will be addressing topics like abortion, marriage, moral relativism, reproduction, end of life care, and family. These topics are all intertwined in everyone's daily lives. Doing the Right Thing is a nationwide initi initiative to explore these issues at the Academy. However, what if we were not even allowed or encouraged to discuss these controversial topics? In order to have a culture where everyone has a voice, we must also acknowledge the importance of our right to dissent. Specifically, as college students, you need to understand that the First Amendment of the United States Constitution protects your right to a robust and vital public dialogue. The Constitution protects the right of speech, association, and access for all students, faculty, and staff on public university campuses. The Free to Disagree Corollary to Ethics Week encourages you to exercise your rights on campus and make sure that your voice is heard. The message you share and your unique, your unique perspective will strengthen the collegiate experience for everyone. Now on to our specific topic for this evening, sexuality and marriage. Please take a look at the printed program you were given as you came in and note the questions on the back panel. Throughout the event, please take a few minutes to fill out the questionnaire. At the end of the evening, you'll be asked to turn this in at the end. Also, don't forget to hand in the cards to take to the back table for the ISI book that you could, might be able to win. Now on to our speakers. It is my privilege to introduce the speakers for this evening, Ryan T. Anderson and Keely Fedoric. Ryan T. Anderson researches and writes about marriage and religious liberty as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and a Free Society at the Heritage Foundation. Anderson is the editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute of Princeton, New Jersey. He is the co-author with Princeton's Robert P. George and Sharif Gurges of What is Marriage? Man, Woman, a Defense, a book that was cited in the recent Supreme Court decision regarding marriage. Keely Fedorik has experience in constitutional law and federal issues related to life, marriage, and religious freedom. She serves as a litigation counsel with the Alliance Defending Freedom at its Washington, D.C. Regional Service Center, where she is an invaluable member of the Center for Marriage and Family. Everyone, please welcome our first speaker, Ryan Anderson.
Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to take just a couple minutes. Um, the title of this is, What Does Ethics Have to Do With It? Um, so I'm going to talk about marriage and sexuality primarily under the guise of social justice as the primary ethical category that has to do with it. I'm going to talk about marriage, what it is, why it matters for a political community, why it matters that civil society get marriage right. And then I'll close by saying a few things about what ethics has to do with it as uh, personal morality, uh, virtue, um, and those sorts of things. So we're going to start with a public argument about marriage under the guise of social justice and then transition into uh, personal morality. But first, a word about what I'm not going to say today. Uh, I'm not going to speak about theology tonight. I'm not going to speak about tradition. I'm not going to make an argument from tradition. There are some people who make an argument about marriage that because this is how marriage has been, this is the way it ought to be. Uh, that won't be my argument. And I'm not going to say anything uh, about homosexuality. Um, you can be in favor or not in favor of homosexuality uh, and still have to answer the question of what is marriage. In fact, I think that's probably the foundational question. The opponents, um, or the proponents of redefining marriage have a nice slogan. Their slogan is marriage equality. And they refuse to answer the question that I think is actually foundational, the, pr the question that's prior to anything about equality, which is definitional, the question, what is marriage? I like to say that everyone in this debate is for marriage equality. We all want the law and civil society to treat all marriages in the same way. We want the law to treat marriage equally. But that doesn't yet tell us what is the institution of marriage and what makes a marital relationship different from other relationships. Every marriage policy will draw a line between what is a marriage and relationships that aren't marriages. Uh, the question for uh, equality is what lines ought to be drawn. Only if we know what marriage is can we know if the lines that we're drawing are treating marriages equally or not, if they're treating them justly or not. The best uh, view of marriage, the best uh, case for marriage that we've seen that includes same-sex relationships as marriages uh, understands marriage as something like an intense emotional relationship. It, seems, it sees marriage as the most important or the most intense romantic interpersonal relationship that one might form. It involves caregiving, it involves support. Um, it's not clear to me on this vision of marriage why the state's in the marriage business or why marriage has the characteristics that has traditionally been associated with marriage. So my co-authors and I just think that this vision of marriage just simply gets marriage wrong. What it's describing is companionship. It's not describing a marital relationship. Uh, one philosopher that we quote in our book and who we've discussed with in various uh, fora, John Corvino calls marriage, you know, it establishes your relationship with what he calls your number one person. That's the marital relationship. It's your number one person. The question for us is, why is it your number one rather than your number one and two or three and four? Why is it supposed to be a permanent relationship? Why is it supposed to be an exclusive relationship? That is, the three hallmarks of marriage in American law have been marriage uh, as a monogamous relationship, marriage as a sexually exclusive relationship, and marriage as a permanent relationship. But if marriage is primarily about romance and an intense emotional relationship and about mutual caregiving and support, it's not clear why that can only take place between two people. It seems that three or four or more people can have intense emotional regard for each other, can have romantic feelings for each other, can pledge to take care of each other. And so there seems to be no reason in principle why the law would recognize the marital relationship as something that's between only two consenting adults. Likewise, there seems to be no reason why marriage would call for exclusivity, and in particular, sexual exclusivity. Um, some relationships might be enhanced by only having sexual relations inside of the marriage with the spouses. Other relationships, if you know, they're consensual and if there's no deceit, there's no lying, there's no coercion, could be enhanced if marriage is an intense emotional union by having sexual relations outside of marriage. So it's not clear on the view that marriage is an intense emotional relationship why sexual relations ought to be reserved for marriage. And then lastly, it's not clear why this view gets marriage right if marriage is supposed to be a permanent relationship because intense emotional relationships can come and go. They can wax and they can wane. And why can't you have a temporary intense emotional relationship? Who says that because you're having a romantic connection with a person today that you ought 
to retain that romantic connection 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, or even just a day from now. So it's not clear how on this vision of marriage, marriage should either be a monogamous institution or a permanent institution or a sexually exclusive institution. And for that matter, it's not clear why government would be in the marriage business at all. If marriage is just about the consenting love lives of adults, why don't we just get the government out of the marriage business? It seems that we don't need to have government in the bedroom if it's just about the love and tender feelings and care of adults. We can do that without having government regulation. So it seems to my co-authors and I that just, just gets marriage wrong. And so during the Q&A, um, if you disagree with us, it would be wonderful to entertain questions as to why this view gets marriage right, or if there's a superior view, a superior view of what marriage is that would include same-sex relationships and explain why marriage ought to be a monogamous, permanent, and sexually exclusive relationship. Uh, we put this challenge to our critics and to various other authors, and we've yet to find a persuasive uh, response. Uh, so hopefully we can have that tonight. So if that's what marriage isn't, what is marriage? My co-authors and I argue that what sets marriage apart from other relationships is that it's a comprehensive union and that this is what makes marriage different than other forms of companionship, and what makes marriage different from friendship in general, and what makes marriage different than something like an academic community or a sports team. And I mention those because those will be the examples that I'll refer to uh, by comparison. The analysis that we give for marriage, what marriage is and why it matters, uh, flows from a generally Aristotelian account. And you can analyze any sort of community, any, sort of, uh, any form of association by looking at the action that the members of the community engage in, the goods that the members of the community pursue, and then the norms or the commitments that the members of the community live by. And so to give an example, think of a university community. Think of Rutgers. It's an academic community, and so you engage in academic action. Those are the types of action that make you a distinctively academic community, that make you a university. You attend lectures and your professors deliver lectures. You read books, your professors write books. Um, you take tests, your professor grades tests. You go to office hours and you um, discuss the topics of the lectures and of your upcoming term papers and of the final exam. All of these actions are what make an academic community distinctively academic. Um, what are these actions aimed at? They're aimed at the pursuit of truth. Uh, what you're trying to do here is not just uh, engage in propaganda, indoctrination. You're not just trying to justify whatever opinions you happen to hold just because they're yours, but you're trying to shed away your false opinions. You're trying to get rid of ignorance and acquire truth, and then appropriate that truth into your lives, into your character, so that you can live out the truth. Those are the goods um, that an academic community are pursuing, is pursuing. So then what are the norms, the types of commitments that an academic community lives by? Things like um, academic integrity and honesty. You don't plagiarize your papers. Um, you cite all of your sources. If you're a researcher that uses data, you cite all of the data, even the data that might cut against your hypothesis so that other scholars can replicate your experiments, can check your footnotes and see if your sources actually say what you claim they say. Um, because this actually helps the academic process discover the truth. If you write a paper, you want your professor to check out your footnotes and say, wait, I think you're quoting this out of context. That's not what the author meant there. Or you want another scholar to come by and examine your data and say, wait, I think you made a mistake in analyzing the data. Because what your whole enterprise is oriented towards is knowledge of the truth. And so you have actions that pursue the truth, and you have norms that govern that pursuit. So we say the same analysis can be used to investigate what a marital relationship is and what separates and distinguishes a marital relationship from other types of human relationship. And we argue that marriage is comprehensive in those three exact ways. It's comprehensive in the acts that spouses engage in, it's comprehensive in the goods that spouses pursue, and it's comprehensive in the norms of commitment that it demands of spouses in order to be a marriage. What do I mean by that? Marriage is comprehensive in that it unites us at all levels of our personhood. It unites us at hearts and minds, but it also unites us as bodily beings. It unites us towards a comprehensive good, not the good of any particular um, individuals or any particular um, aspect of goodness. So it's not just orient us towards the good of truth or the good of winning a football game or the good of beauty or art, but it's orienting us towards the whole array of human goods because it's orienting us towards creating new life 
and then raising that new life to flourish as an individual who can appreciate all forms of human goodness. And then lastly, it demands a comprehensive commitment of us, a comprehensive commitment throughout time, so permanency, and a comprehensive commitment at each and every time, so exclusivity, forsaking all others. And the type of exclusivity that it calls for is sexual exclusivity, precisely because it's the sexual act that unites spouses in this comprehensive way. So that was a mouthful. I don't expect you to uh, pick that up on the first go through, so I'm gonna unpack each step of that argument uh, right now. The first thing, the comprehensive action. Because we're bodily beings, we're not just ghosts and machines, we're not just spirits, we're not just intellects. To unite comprehensively with another person requires that you unite at every level of your personhood. Ordinary friendships don't require that. Those are friendships of hearts and minds. You don't unite bodily with your ordinary friends. Likewise, an academic community is a union of hearts and minds. You're pursuing the truth, but you don't engage in bodily union. The marital relationship does that because it extends a union of hearts and minds into this bodily domain precisely to unite in this comprehensive way. How can two people unite bodily? How can they unite comprehensively? The answer to that question uh, requires us thinking about what is it that makes any given body one body? What is it that makes my body a single organism? What is it that makes my various organs, my heart and my lungs, my muscles, my bones, my skin, all these various parts, one body, rather than just a disaggregate heap of cells. I'm not just a clump of cells. So what is it that makes me a unity? It's that all these various organs, all these various systems are actively coordinating with each other for the common good of my biological life. They're organizing themselves in a way that sustains my bodily being. My co-authors and I argue that in the same way, in the conjugal act, a man and a woman unite comprehensively so that their bodies unite towards a common good of the two of them, a common good of the mated pair. With respect to all biological functions but one, human beings are complete. Digestion, locomotion, these are things that I do on my own. But when it comes to reproduction, we're radically incomplete. It requires a man and a woman in the conjugal act to unite to pursue one biological end, the reproduction of the species, but it's that mated pair. So that in conjugal action, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, truly form one flesh. The phrase that the Hebrew scriptures use, use isn't just metaphorical. It's not just poetic. It's not just a nice lofty ideal. It's a reality. A man and a woman in a conjugal act truly do become one flesh. They form a two-in-one flesh union that extends a union of hearts and minds into this bodily dimension. So in the same way that when we discussed the academic community, I said we engage in various academic action and what is it oriented towards? It's oriented towards the discovery and appropriation of the truth. We can consider what is the conjugal act, the marital act, what is that naturally oriented towards? And it's oriented towards the creation of new life and the bearing and rearing of that new life. It's the same act that unites a husband and a wife in this comprehensive way that also unites them towards the creation of a new child and then demands of them that they raise that child to maturity so that that child then can flourish in all the various aspects of human goodness. Not just this or that aspect of human goodness, not just to become um, well-educated or to become a good athlete, but to flourish in all of the ways that we can flourish. And so in that way, it's a comprehensive good that the spouses are pursuing. And the actions that they perform tell us something about the good that that type of relationship is naturally oriented to. So then lastly, it calls for a comprehensive commitment, comprehensive commitment both throughout time, meaning that if you're gonna pledge yourself to another person in this interpersonal union, it's for keeps, it's for life. You can't unite comprehensively with another person if you hold something back. And then likewise, it demands that you forsake all others, it demands exclusivity. But the type of exclusivity that it demands is sexual exclusivity. You don't cheat on your spouse if you discuss chemistry with someone other than your spouse. You don't cheat on your spouse if you play tennis with someone other than your spouse. So those aren't the distinctive activities of marriage. You do cheat on your spouse if you sleep with someone other than your spouse. Because it's sex that unites us in this bodily way with another person and so changes a union that was just a union of hearts and minds 
into this comprehensive union. And so in that sense, you could think that um, sleeping with another person is akin to plagiarizing your term paper. You know, it frustrates the, the precise uh, goal of the union. If the goal of the union is to pursue truth and you're plagiarizing your work, then it's not your work. You're misrepresenting, you're being untruthful right from the get-go. And if you unite with someone else bodily, then you're not comprehensively uniting with your spouse because the action that's distinctive of that relationship isn't being reserved and utilized to embody, express, and realize the marital bond. The basic uh, sketch that I just gave and that we go into much more detail in the book is something that we find expressed in the ancient Romans and Greeks, thinkers like Plato and Aristotle, uh, Musinius, Rufus, and Plutarch all suggest that a vision like this. Uh, we see it in the canon law of the church, but also the common law in the English tradition and the civil law of the American tradition. We see it in Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Kant. We see it in Eastern thinkers like Gandhi. What we think this suggests is that this vision of marriage isn't the particular province of any given theological or philosophical or political community, but it's grounded in human nature. There's something about human beings as created male and female with the sexual differentiation between a man and a woman, and what that allows is a possibility for comprehensive union, for the bearing and rearing of children that has many different political, theological, and philosophical communities identifying this crux of a human good. None of them articulate it in quite the way that my co-authors and I articulate it. None of them have all the precise contours that we lay out, but they all have something approaching this conception of marriage. And so for us, that demands an explanation. When you see this sort of a human, universal human experience up until the year 2000, it calls for an explanation. And this is the philosophical explanation that we've given for it. But that said, you can say, all right, maybe that's what marriage is. What does ethics have to do with that? What does social justice have to do with that? What does the state have to do with that? So now I want to pivot to answer that question. Um, social justice is primarily about promoting the common good. And for a political community, it's particularly important to protect the weak, the marginalized, the oppressed, and to give the least among us the best chance of a flourishing life. That's what ethics demands of a political community. That's why government's in the marriage business. Government's in the marriage business to protect the rights and the needs of children, to maximize the likelihood that they will be raised by the man and the woman who gave them life. So we argue that from the state's uh, perspective, marriage exists to unite a man and a woman as husband and wife, to be mother and father to any children that their ch uh, union creates. It's based on the truth that men and women are sexually complementary, that reproduction requires a man and a woman, and that children deserve a mom and a dad. A part of this is based on a biological fact that whenever a child is born, a mother will be close by. That's simply a fact of biology. The question for culture is, will a father be close by? And if so, for how long? And the law in this case can help support that culture by promoting the truth about marriage, or the law can help destroy that culture by promoting a falsehood. What we know from the social science, including research from your own uh, David Popino in the sociology department, is that there's no such thing as parenting in the abstract. There's mothering and there's fathering. That men and women bring different gifts to the parenting enterprise and that children do best when they have both a mother and a father. Uh, Popino writes, quote, the burden of social science evidence support the idea that gender differentiated parenting is important for human development and that the contribution of fathers to child rearing is unique and irreplaceable. He then concludes, quote, we should disavow the notion that mommies can make good daddies, just as we should disavow the popular notion that daddies can make good mommies. The two sexes are different to the core, and each is necessary culturally and biologically for the optimal development of a human being, end quote. Uh, we then cite a host of social science in both the book and in uh, various papers that I've written for the Heritage Foundation that just go through all of the various statistics on why marriage between a mother and a father, preferably a biological mother and a father, really, do, uh, really does matter for a child, which can explain why the government's in the marriage business. It's not because it cares about my love life. The government's not in the marriage business because it cares about the butterfly feelings that someone gets when they fall in love. That's all that marriage is, the state can get out of the bedroom. No, the state's in the marriage because marriage is a personal relationship 
that really serves the common good. It's a personal relationship with public significance. It's the least restrictive way any political community can ensure the well-being of future citizens. Because either the man and the woman who create that child take responsibility for raising that child, or some thir third party is going to have to take responsibility for that child, frequently at the expense of the broader community and at the expense of the child, him or herself. So what we know from the social science, um, I'll read a quote from President Obama. Quote, we know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They're more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves. And the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. Fathers matter and marriage helps connect fathers to mothers and then that man and that woman, that mother and that father to children. What we saw during the 70s and the 80s as the marriage culture began to fall apart in America, that this is when child poverty rose, this is when crime increased, it's when social mobility decreased, it's when the prison population increased, it's when the welfare state exploded. So everything that you could care about, if you care about both social justice and limited government, if you care about both the poor and you care about freedom, are better served by a healthy marriage culture than by a debased marriage culture where government then tries to pick up the pieces of a breakdown in civil society. So that said, I'll say three things uh, as to the likely consequences of the redefinition of marriage, and then I'll close with a word um, about ethics in an additional sense. The vision of marriage that I painted at the beginning as an intense emotional union is something that informs uh, many relationships, um, both heterosexual and homosexual. There's nothing distinctively gay about that vision of marriage. It's true that it can include same-sex relationship under some umbrella, but it's not something that's distinctively um, the province of just same-sex relationships. So the question in law for redefining marriage in civil society is will it replace this comprehensive union view of what marriage is and why it matters with a vision of marriage that's based much more on adult, romantic, and emotional desire. Um, my co-author and I argue that, argue that it will. That's precisely what will happen. It won't be increasing um, uh, the, the, the category of who's eligible for marriage. It will be abolishing one conception of what marriage is and replacing it with another conception. And one of the things that the law will then do is it will teach that this is what marriage is and these are the demands that it requires of spouses. So the first consequence that we highlight is that it will eliminate from law any institution that even upholds as an ideal that children deserve a mother and a father, that men and women are distinct, that they're not interchangeable, and that not only do children deserve a mother and a father, but they deserve a married mother and father. It's very hard for the law to teach that fathers are, in, are essential in the way that President Obama discussed in that quote that I read, when the law redefines marriage to make fathers optional. How does the law simultaneously say fathers really matter when it also says that two mothers are the same thing as a mother and a father? Or that two mothers or two fathers are the same thing as a mother and a father? It's hard for the law to be doing double duty there. And there won't be an institution that really upholds the needs of children over the desires of adults. The redefinition of marriage so that it's an intense emotional relationship makes it much more about adults than about children. And the only reason governments in the marriage business is to protect the needs and the rights of children. So that's the first consequence, is how it will shape the public understanding of what marriage is. The second consequence is that the redefinition of marriage wouldn't stop just with the sexual complementarity aspect. If you argue that the union of a man and a woman is irrational and arbitrary, to view marriage as something that's uh, intrinsically conjugally based between a man and a woman, where sexual complementarity goes to the heart of what marriage is, what principle is left for why marriage should be something that's monogamous or exclusive or permanent? So at the beginning I said this is a challenge for that other vision of marriage that they don't seem to be able to answer. It then becomes a challenge for our law, for if we do redefine marriage to say that it's arbitrary and irrational, to say that it's a male-female relationship, what do you say if you're the Supreme Court justice who hears the case of the same-sex thruple. A thruple is a three-person couple. And so when they come to your court and they say, 
your marriage laws are violating our marriage equality rights. They're not treating our marriage equally. We have a three-person marriage. We want the same sorts of recognition and benefits and social approval as the same-sex couple. What will your response be? What principle will there be that limits marriage to a two-person relationship once you say that male-female unions aren't anything special? Because the reason that we arrived at monogamy in American marriage law is that it was one man and one woman who can unite in this sort of action that produces new life, and every child has exactly one mother and one father. Other than that, there's nothing magical about the number two. There's nothing particularly principled or special about monogamy apart from the type of union that it allows for between conjugally, um, uh, uh, sexually complementary spouses. So that's one new word, the thruple. We discovered that word in New York Magazine back when we were doing research for the book. Another word that we discovered was uh, wed lease. A wed lease is a play on the term wedlock. Wedlock connotes something that's permanent and stable and sturdy. Um, locks are important. A wed lease implies something that's temporary and transient. You can lease a car. You can lease a house. Why not lease a bride? Uh, this was the argument that was made in the Washington Post earlier this year by an attorney who was saying that the problem with marriage in America is that we have unrealistic expectations. We expect it to last forever, but we can't pledge to love and care for one other person for the entirety of life. We should reform marriage law to make it a temporary license that can be renewed on good behavior. So if after five years things aren't working out, you just walk away because you only had a five-year marriage contract from the beginning. No harm, no foul, no hard feelings. But if it's going well, you can renew it for another five-year term, this sort of an idea. And then the last new term that we came across was from a New York Times profile of Dan Savage, and this is the term monogamish. A monogamish relationship is a play on the word monogamous. And so it's a two-person relationship, but it's sexually open. Um, so this argument is that marriage is an intense emotional romantic bond, but sometimes that union can actually be enhanced by having sexual relationships outside of marriage. That again, we're not being realistic, and part of the problem of American marriage laws that it places this, is, places this unrealistic expectation on spouses to only sleep with each other for the rest of their lives. But sometimes you need to spice things up in the bedroom and that requires having these extramarital outlets. And again, provided there's no coercion and there's no deceit, what's wrong with it? Now, whatever the ethics are of three-person or four-person marriages or temporary marriages or sexually open marriages, Think about what the public policy consequences would be. Think about what the social justice consequences would be. Again, the reason the state's in the marriage business is to ensure that every child that's conceived has a relationship with the man and the woman who created that child. But for every additional sexual partner I have, and for every short-lived sexual relationship that I have, the greater the likelihood that I create fragmented families and fatherless children. For every additional woman I sleep with, there's a greater chance that our union produces a child, and then my attention, my money, my resources, my love, and my care are then divided across those families, between those women, between those children. So how will the law teach that men and women should commit to each other permanently and exclusively to then be mothers and fathers to the children they create when we've redefined marriage to make it about the consenting love lives of adults in whatever sizes or shapes consenting love comes in. So that's the second consequence. The last consequence has to deal with religious liberty, and we have a wonderful uh, religious liberty attorney here who will focus on that. So I'll just say a brief word about that, and then uh, Kelly will go into uh, more detail there. But we've already seen examples in Massachusetts, in Washington, D.C., and in Illinois, where uh, the government has shut down uh, Catholic charities that were running adoption agencies. And this had nothing to do with funding, it just had to do with licensing. It's illegal to run an adoption agency if you don't have an adoption license. And the government said, unless you place children with same-sex couples on an equal basis as you do with married mothers and fathers, we won't give you a marriage license because you're not treating these couples equally, you're discriminating. Uh, the institutions argued we have social science that show that men and women parent in different ways, that children do best with mom and dad, moms and dads, and we have this thing called the First Amendment. But in all three jurisdictions, the government wouldn't give them an adoption agency license, and they were forced to close their doors, which does nothing to help the orphans. 
So again, there's a social justice violation here. Children are not served by having fewer adoption and foster care services. But we've also seen bakers and uh, innkeepers and photographers and florists and a whole host of cases that Kelly will talk about of how the law has discriminated against coercing uh, people of faith who couldn't in good conscience lend their artistic services to a same-sex ceremony. So that said, I just want to say a word about what else ethics has to do with it, the title of tonight's presentation. The only way we arrived at a cultural and political moment at which the concept of redefining marriage to eliminate the expectation of sexual complementarity so as to include same-sex relationships was a live possibility was a result of a host of um, uh, unethical sexual behavior on the part of heterosexuals. During the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, including right down to this very moment, heterosexuals bought into a liberal ideology about sex uh, that more or less said if it feels good, do it, and that if it's consensual, then it's ethical. And you saw this in things like the rise in pornography and the hookup culture, the rise in premarital sex and adultery, the rise in divorce. A whole bunch of activities that put the desires of adults over the needs of children and that more or less made a mockery of the institution of marriage. The virtue that governs, that promotes the good of marriage. So if the first part of this talk was really about a false vision of what marriage is and then an alternative true vision of what marriage is, there's a virtue that helps prepare us to live out the truth about marriage, the virtue of chastity. So what ethics has to do with it is helping individuals prepare themselves in their sexual behavior to live out the truth about marriage. If it's the sexual act, a conjugal union, that allows for a marriage to be consummated, to be expressed, realized, and actualized, and renewed, to embody that relationship, then there are a host of ways in which our own sexual behavior can either detract from that or promote that. And whether it's um, college hookups, or pornography in the dorm rooms, or premarital sex, or affairs with coworkers, or divorce for trivial reasons. There are a whole host of ways in which Americans have debased the truth about marriage by failing to live it out in their own lives. So then you arrive at a point where if we already don't have marriages that are permanent, we redefined marriage 40 years ago with no-fault divorce. Marriage used to have an expectation, a strong expectation of permanency in law. In common law, it was the three A's that gave you grounds for divorce, abuse, abandonment, and adultery. And you would file for a divorce and you would cite the reason why. Your spouse abused you, your spouse abandoned you, your spouse committed adultery. With the introduction of no-fault divorce laws, you could now divorce your spouse for any reason or for no reason at all. So you could more or less walk away from your marriage, from your marriage contract, in ways that are easier than walking away from a contract with a painter or a roofer. So it made it something that had an expectation of, well, permanency is nice if it's for you, but it can also be temporary. And we saw the divorce rates change as a result. We saw divorce rates that were once in single digits rise to nearly 50%. And what that shows us is that the law functions as a teacher. But once we weakened one norm of marriage, the permanency norm, and then we weakened the exclusivity norm because there was more and more premarital and extramarital sex, it's not surprising that another norm of marriage, sexual complementarity, is the one that's being challenged today. Um, so what that really demands of us, with you know, what's ethics have to do with it, is a commitment to live out the truth about marriage in our own lives. Uh, rational arguments, philosophical arguments, uh, do so much good, um, but the lived reality of marriage, it's the lives of the saints that ultimately persuade people about the truth of a certain course of action. Um, so what it really demands is each one of us living out the virtue of chastity. Please join me now in welcoming Keely Fedoric to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac, and thanks to everyone um, for coming out tonight and for being here. You know, part of my job that I love the most is being able to come and to speak, especially with students. And, and so it's exciting and it's inspiring to see that all of you are, are here tonight. And we truly live 
in a really challenging time. Um, there are a lot of messages out there about love, about happiness, and about marriage. Um, and many of you might wonder if it really matters. Maybe some of you think it's a good thing to redefine marriage. Um, you might be on a whole wide array of, of where you come down on this issue. But the fact that you're here tonight shows me that you're engaged and that you care to learn about the arguments about marriage and, and what, what, um, what, what marriage is and, and why it matters. And I hope that by the end of tonight, you will have at least a better understanding of, of what it is. And perhaps you'll even leave here with more um, excitement and conviction to defend this important institution that matters so much to, the, to, to our families, to children, and to society as a whole. And so, you know, as Ryan was saying, there's, there's many factors that have contributed to the breakdown of marriage and why it's become a, become a more a weakened institution. Most of us here tonight have experienced either ourselves personally or we've witnessed friends who have gone through divorce or who, whose parents have, have been divorced. We've seen and lived firsthand that pain. We've also witnessed what infidelity can do to marriage. We um, know people or perhaps have experienced becoming pregnant outside of, outside of marriage and having to face the choices that come when that happens. So, so we've all, we all recognize and have lived out what some of this, some of the downfall and the weakening of marriage uh, means. And, and all of these situations, as Ryan was, was articulating, have really contributed to the breakdown of what I like to call the marriage culture um, in our country and really in society at large. And, and there's no denying that there's been a fundamental shift in our perspective. Um, marriage was once seen more as um, self-gift, giving of love to another. And it's shifted now into more of what's in this for me, um, an emotional intensity, a personal satisfaction. Um, and this is a truly dangerous place when it comes to marriage um, because if it's really all about emotional intensity or what's in it for me or if it, is this making me happy, well then, if you're not happy, well then you would leave. So this is another way marriage has, has been weakened. And then you have the effort to redefine marriage uh, entirely. And what has been part of society for, for centuries, which is the union of one man and one woman coming together, when you have this effort to, to, to break that down and change it, um, it, 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 it has significant implications. And while some people might argue that allowing same-sex marriage might actually strengthen marriage, uh, the reality is, is that it, when, you re, when you redefine marriage as something other than a man and woman, it has significant um, implications, and it actually will weaken marriage for, um, further. And we're just now embarking on sort of this social experiment of allowing same-sex couples to marry. So we don't yet know all of the implications, but there are definitely some of them which we're going to talk about um, today. And a great example is if you think about a picture, you have this beautiful picture in an art gallery, but over time, this picture has, the colors have faded. There's probably a crack in the glass. Cobwebs have gathered on the picture. So what are you gonna do to strengthen that? Are you gonna dust up the cobwebs and strengthen the institution? Or are you going to allow the dust to gather further and allow the picture to fade even more? And with marriage, it's the same thing. We need to engage on this issue and understand why, what marriage is and why, and why it matters um, in, in order to restore a marriage culture. And as Ryan was explaining, marriage is a very bedrock of our society. And it's a relationship unlike any other because marriage is the only relationship. One man and one woman can, are the only two people who can come together to create new life. And it's also based on the reality that children do best with both a mom and a dad. So clearly, marriage needs to be strengthened. But how do we go about defending it? How do we go about rebuild, rebuilding this institution? Tonight, I want to give you a, a starting point, something to at least think about um, in terms of this question. So I want to briefly start by talking about the Supreme Court's recent marriage decisions this past June, just as sort of a general overview, overview to discuss what they said. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about why the government cares about the marriage relationship in the first place. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the consequences of redefining marriage and the implications that that has 
for our First Amendment freedoms and for society at large. And then lastly, I just want to propose some concrete steps for all of you in terms of um, engaging and considering this issue more deeply. So where are we? As many of you know, the Supreme Court in, at the end of June came down um, with two marriage decisions. And they were considering, in one case, a state marriage law that defined marriage as one man and one woman. And in the other case, they were considering a provision of a statute that defined, for purposes of federal law, that marriage is, is one man and one woman. And really, the court struck down in the, in the federal case, in the Windsor decision, it struck down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. And it basically said, look, Federal government, Congress, you guys went too far. Marriage is supposed to be left to the realms of the state. It's the state's right to define laws um, about marriage. And so when you define marriage between one man and one woman, you um, usurped the role of the state, and you can't do that. With Prop 8, which was the state law, the constitutional amendment in California, essentially what the court did was leave that in significant legal limbo, and so there's a lot of um, questions on really what exactly is the state of the law in, in California. But really for our purposes today, there's two important points to take from these two decisions. One is that the Supreme Court said nothing, in, in both cases, said nothing good or bad about same-sex marriage. They did not find a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And this is significant because when uh, the proponents of redefining marriage set out, their goal, their end game, was to redefine marriage for the entire country and to impose a new, impose a new definition of marriage on the whole country, and which is one that, that would allow, we would find a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And the court didn't do this. The court refused to do that, in fact. And they also refused to find that same-sex marriage is a civil rights issue. So that's the first point to take, to take home, is that there, there was no right found by the Supreme Court that there's a right to same-sex marriage. Secondly, the way in which the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down poses significant uh, dangers to our First Amendment freedoms. Our ability to speak freely or refrain from speaking on these important issues, um, as well as our ability to speak according to our convictions, to live, out, live our lives according to these beliefs, um, all of these were called into question. And that's because Justice Kennedy, in his decision when he came down, he basically said that there was no rational reason that Congress or President Bill Clinton in 1996, there was no rational reason that they could have defined marriage as between one man and one woman. He said that the only, only motivating factor that could have um, propelled them was they must have had bias towards same-sex couples and they must have been motivated by hate or animus. Now that's a really, really significant statement to make, regardless of your position on same-sex marriage. Because if you think about it, what is this saying? This is saying that significant majorities in both the House of Representatives and the United States Senate and President Bill Clinton, the only reason that they decided to pass a law in 1996 was motivated by, by um, a distaste or a hatred even. He said they were enemies of the human race um, to define marriage in this way. And that ignores centuries and centuries of how society has defined marriage from the very, very beginning of time. It also ignores the fact that um, every state in the union had defined it, and really same-sex marriage had not really even been uh, considered uh, really up until around that point in time. So to say that all of these different individuals didn't have any rational reason, they didn't have a reason for that perhaps marriage is good for society because it brings a uh, husband and wife together, it helps the law to encourage them to stay faithful to one another, it encourages them to be moms and dads, their kids, marriage is good for children, it ignored sex, social science evidence, none of these reasons the court found. So this, this has a significant um, implications and wrongly implies that those who believe marriage is a good thing, that bringing men and women together in that relationship is a good thing, it wrongly implies that they're motivated by some sort of um, dislike for same-sex couples, which is, um, is most certainly not the case. Everyone is free to love whom they choose, and the government is not required to change, but the government is not required to change its definition of, of marriage 
um, but just because it doesn't have an interest in certain kinds of relationships. So stepping back a minute, I wanted to, to re-highlight what Ryan was talking about, about what marriage is. Marriage brings a man and a woman together as husband and wife in a committed relationship um, to then be father and mother to any children that they might have. And to change the, the meaning of marriage from a gender definition to a genderless relationship would undermine, if not change entirely, the very fabric of the society in which we live. Now, you might, you might think that same-sex marriage is a good thing, but I would at least encourage you as, as we talk and we dialogue tonight that there are a lot of unintended consequences that perhaps you haven't seen about what it looks like for a society where no longer is the norm to have a mom and a dad, to have men and women coming together to create children and to ensure that, that civilization um, continues. So why does the government care about marriage? This is always an interesting point for me, so let's think about this for a second. The, relation, the, the government doesn't come in and care about my relationship with my best friend. Um, they don't care about my relationship with my boyfriend. Um, they don't care about your guys' relationships with your siblings, with your um, classmates. The government really doesn't have much interest in most types of relationships. But it takes a lot of interest, and it historically has taken a lot of interest in the marriage relationship. Um, so, so why is this? Why does it care about marriage and really not care about even other very loving, very committed types of relationships? Well, it has a unique interest in marriage because it sees the marital relationship as benefiting society in a way that no other relationship can. It, it, it sees marriage as bringing a man and woman together to commit to each other and it also sees in that relationship the best environment for which children can be brought into. And history also reveals to us that when men and women are in these types of relationships, it bodes best for society both, both fiscally and so socially. But I, I really want to, folk, to stress for just a minute the procreative aspect of, of why the government has an interest in marriage. Because men and women, as I said earlier, that relationship, they're the only ones who can um, bring forth new life. It's, it's biologically, physically impossible for two women to produce children or for two men to produce children. And, and, er, and marriage furthers then every child's natural desire to know, you know where he came from and who his parents are and who his grandparents are. And so I think it's important to think about this from this, this angle. The government wants to make sure that children as much as possible can be raised by a mom and a dad. And I, I recognize that there are obviously situations where this doesn't happen. We have you know, heroic single moms and single dads out there who have done terrific jobs raising their children. So I'm not talking about these situations. I'm talking about the government and what the government should put forth as what's ideal, what's best. What should the government encourage families to do wherever possible? And I think, um, I don't know how many of you watch the show Modern Family, but um, I, I find the show interesting. And um, I noticed an episode a couple weeks ago, maybe you all have seen it, and it basically showed you know, the, two, the two gay dads the two of their little girl, they adopted her from Vietnam. And um, she, they decided she was asking some questions and she really needed to have a mother figure. She needed to have a mom. So they arranged for her to have a date with their, um, with her aunt. And so the aunt came over to take the little girl on a, on a girl's date. Because the reality that the show was, was revealing was that something was lacking in that relationship. And while those two dads obviously were, loved their daughter, they were they're in the show obviously, they're trying to provide a wonderful nurturing environment for her, there was, there was something missing. There was something missing because she didn't have a, a female role model as a mother in her life. And I don't know, you'll, you'll recall there was another episode where the young girl was wondering who her mother was. And she was asking her dad, and they didn't really want to tell her. And then they told her she was a princess from some other country. Um, but, the, but the point is, is this little girl wanted to have a relationship with her mother. She wanted to know who she was. And this is something that's, that's natural. It's innate in all of us that we, we, would, we desire to know where we came from 
and wherever possible to know who our mom is and who, who our dad is. So the government sees um, marriage and that relationship and wants to support and encourage that to ensure and guarantee that children's needs are placed over the desires of, of other, other people, of, of other adults. So, so when we redefine marriage, we then tell children that we chose for you not to be able to ever know your mom, or we chose that it was better for you not to ever know your dad. It also it places, as Ryan was saying, a new idea into the law, that marriage is whatever emotional bond the government wants it to be, instead of focus on the needs of children and family and then society at large. It also, uh, redefining marriage, um, pushes out traditional views of the family, and it leads to the erosion of, of religious freedom, which is the next part of what I wanted to say to all of you tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Chariots of Fire. How many of you have seen Chariots of Fire? Okay, some of you, good. Sometimes I ask this question, everyone raises their hand, and then other times people don't, so I never know if I should use it, but I'm glad some of you have seen it. Well, many of you will recall that the runner, Eric Little, when accused of um, being impertinent, or he's accused of being impertinent, after he re refuses to run a race on Sunday, and because of his religious convictions. And he famously responds, the impertinence lies, sir, with those who seek to influence a man to deny his beliefs. That seeks to influence a man to deny his beliefs. This impertinence is what our founding fathers decided must be avoided at all costs. They recognize that to force a person to deny his beliefs um, really could not be tolerated, which is the significance of why we have the First Amendment. That, and why our country was founded on this principle that the freedom of speech and religious liberty are essential freedoms that belong to each and every one of us. And this is, this is a really important concept because a functioning and thriving society hinges on whether we respect and we tolerate each other's beliefs regardless of how much we might disagree with those beliefs. Indeed, the very idea of tolerance is actually rooted in the idea that we disagree with one another. Um, and to freely exercise our convictions um, will actually, in fact, cause us to be at odds with one another sometimes. So this is, but this historically is what has made America great, that we can live in a diverse and pluralistic society um, and we have the right to disagree and to freely exercise our beliefs. And the government can never force us or compel us to speak or to express any kind of message that we don't want to express. Um, so we have, the, we have the right to remain silent. We also have the right to freely speak out. I want to give some examples tonight, however, of, of everyday Americans who have sincerely held beliefs about marriage and how their beliefs have come into conflict with certain laws that have, that have been enacted recently. But before I do, I want to step back a little bit and, and set up a framework for you all so you sort of understand what I'm talking about. Right now, more, about more than half of the population, according to um, the Beckett Fund for Religious Freedom, they did some research and surveys, about half the population of the United States belong to religious communities that have beliefs about marriage and about sexual, um, sexual identity. And so this is about an estimated 160 million Americans. Simultaneously, we now have laws redefining marriage in 12 states. We have, excuse me, laws that have um, passed civil unions or domestic partnerships in nine states. And we also have laws um, in many states and also in a lot of local communities that have now added sexual orientation and gender identity to the state's non-discrimination laws. So it's not really a surprise that when you have half the US population that it has this very strong, deeply rooted convictions about what marriage is, um, when that comes into conflict with some of these new laws, there's obviously gonna be some tension. And so the question is, what, what do we do about it? And the First Amendment says that we should be able to, as Americans, to live our lives according to our beliefs, whether we're at home, whether we're at school, whether we're in church, wherever we might be, whether we're at work, we, we, are, we have the constitutional right to 
to live our lives according to what we believe in. But so far, the people with sincerely held religious beliefs about marriage have been the ones who have been, have been persecuted and been marginalized. And their freedom to live their lives according to their faith is being suppressed because those who advance a new sexual agenda with which they don't agree, they oppose allowing others the right to disagree. And this is incredibly ironic because often the, the individuals who are behind um, advocating for a new sexual agenda, advocating to redefine marriage, they're also usually very big proponents of tolerance. So it's ironic that the very people advocating tolerance have become this intolerant of those who disagree with them. They fail to recognize that we cannot maintain a pluralistic society and a, a robust debate about these issues unless we are all free, not just to speak, but to live out, to exercise our views. So the real question remains, are the champions of tolerance going to truly tolerate everyone's positions? So far, the answer by and large has been no, and I wanted to share a couple examples um, tonight of fellow Americans who are gi being given a choice no one should really ever have to face, especially in this country. They're being given a choice between losing their job or following their conscience. And the Supreme Court has said time and time again in, in its, its decisions that the First Amendment protects the freedom of the mind, it protects the freedom of religion, and it protects the freedom of speech. You may disagree about marriage, but this is a dangerous precedent to allow people who do support marriage to be persecuted in this way because they're, they're, this will ultimately silence you perhaps on another issue. So it's always important when we're looking at these issues, we may not agree with a specific person on their point of view, but there might come a time when we want to express another, another position or live our life according to our belief and we, not, we, we may not be allowed to do so. So one of our clients that we represent um, is Elaine Huguenin, and she's a photographer um, out in New Mexico. And Elaine was approached by a same-sex couple and was asked to photograph her commitment ceremony. She respectfully declined and said, I'm really sorry, I, I can't participate in that. I can't use my creative expression to facilitate a message that conflicts with my deeply held religious beliefs. So she referred them to another photographer in the city they found a, they went ahead and found another photographer who was actually less expensive than our client and had their commitment ceremony. Subsequently, however, they came back and they sued our client. And she was hauled before the Commission on Civil Rights. She was fined seven thousand dollars, and her case is continually going forward. We litigated her case or argued her case before the New Mexico Supreme Court in March, just a few weeks ago. That court came down with its decision and pretty much said that the right, that the cost of, the cost of citizenship is leaving your beliefs at the door, which is fundamentally against what the First Amendment says. So we are um, hoping, we are taking her case to the U.S. Supreme Court um, to continue to defend her right to live out her life um, according to her beliefs. But a, but a couple of points here I want to highlight. First of all, Elaine gladly takes pictures of gays and lesbians. This is not an issue regarding sexual orientation. She happily serves gay and lesbian clients and will photograph them in individual portraits. But what she can't do is use her expressive ability, her photography business, to promote a message that violates her convictions. And the, the, the same couple, they found another photographer. They were served, they got what they wanted, and yet they, they, they came back and persecuted our client. And this is fundamentally un-American, and it it's fundamentally violates the, the uniqueness of our country in which we can engage in this robust dialogue. We have another case that we're currently representing a client, it's a t-shirt company. And this company was asked to print t-shirts for the local gay rights march. And this is a Christian t-shirt company, and they said to the, to, the, to the organization, you know, I'm really, I'm sorry, we really can't print that message that violates our beliefs. Again, they referred them to a different t-shirt company, but they are now, they are also um, 
being uh, sued. And, and, this, and this company hires gays and lesbians, so this is not an issue, again, of discrimination based on sexual orientation. This is the desire that they did not want to express a message that violated their beliefs, and they should have the right to be able to do that. Now, some of you might be thinking, I've heard the arguments of, well, you know, we don't agree with, with their viewpoint. Take Elaine Huguenin. You know, she should have served the same-sex couple. Um, she shouldn't have, have cared about, about the message. She shouldn't have the right to do that. Well, it's important then to kind of think about some other fact scenarios. You know, there's other examples of, say you're asked, um, maybe you really don't like Susan G. Komen. Maybe you think what they do is really bad. So you want to have t-shirts that are going to argue against Susan G. Komen, have them printed. Well, maybe the owner of the t-shirt company has you know, had breast cancer and really likes Susan G. Komen. She shouldn't be forced to print t-shirts with a message with which she fundamentally disagrees. Um, the same thing could be exemplified with a pro-war rally. You might not disagree with that message. You might not want to participate in that message. You may have a gay photographer who's asked to come and take pictures of a pro-marriage event. Well, he shouldn't be forced to take pictures at a pro-marriage event if, if he doesn't want to. Um, it's America. Um, Another example, you could have a Jewish photographer and you know, a family comes in and wants their whole family picture done. This is a more extreme example, but they you know, have swastikas on their head and their hats and they all want to you know, reenact something from Germany. Well, that might be really offensive to the Jewish photographer and he shouldn't be forced to take those, those, wedding, those, those, those family portraits. So these are just some examples to sort of help us think through some various scenarios of how these laws are being applied and, and what the First Amendment is really all about. Another client that we are currently representing is in the state of Washington. And this case is particularly one that, that I find really outrageous. Um, this is a woman, an older woman, who started her own florist company. And she had been friends with this same-sex couple for about nine years. And she had given them flowers for all sorts of events, you know, birthdays and for their mothers, um, for Mother's Day. And she, she had a very close relationship with these two men. Well, Washington recently redefined its laws on marriage and uh, now allows same-sex marriage. So this couple came to her and said, hey, we'd really like you to design all of our bouquets, all of our floral arrangements um, for our wedding and for our reception. And she had to tell them, look, I've known you all for nine years. You know how much I care about you and how much I love you. But my religious beliefs can't, they, I, I can't, my convictions do, do not allow me to create these floral arrangements for your wedding. I, I'm going to have to decline. And subsequently, um, she, was, she was sued. So she's actually had several lawsuits um, against her. Um, and this is an older woman who lives in a trailer park. She's built her business out of nothing. Um, she's hired, she continues to hire gay and lesbians, which again, my point is, this is not about sexual orientation. It's about redefining marriage. And there are so many Americans who don't want to participate in, in that message because it violates their moral beliefs, their, their religious beliefs, and they, they can't um, be compelled to violate their conscience in that way by participation. So her case is ongoing. Um, another area we find religious freedom and um, free speech in conflict with these new laws um, expanding the sexual agenda uh, is in the area of counseling. We represented a counselor a few years ago in the state of Georgia. And she was approached by a same-sex couple who were seeking counseling advice. And she said, you know what, I really don't feel like I'm the right person to be giving you counseling advice because she really didn't believe that same-sex couples should be you know, together. So she said, let me refer you to my colleague down the hall. So within 10 minutes, the same-sex couple was taken down the hall. And they later, in, their, um, in the form they filled out, they said that they had received exemplary service from this other counselor. So they obviously really enjoyed the, the counseling session they had with the counselor. Well, they came back and filed a claim against our client. And she was later terminated from her job. She no longer has a job at the counseling center for doing nothing more than saying, I'm sorry, I can't, but I will refer you. This is, again, fundamentally un-American, and it's not tolerant. It's not tolerant of all viewpoints, which is what um, America is all about. And the, the take-home point here is this. 
individuals and businesses and, and others, anyone who holds sincere beliefs about human sexuality should never have to face this kind of Hobson's choice to choose between keeping their business open, keeping themselves employed, and potentially and, or forcing, being forced to violate their, their conscience. And, and the reality is every person's beliefs are protected and the government can't isolate one viewpoint and decide that it's not going to tolerate that um, because this has serious ramifications. If it doesn't like one viewpoint today, well, it might not like another viewpoint tomorrow. So it's important that we protect everyone's positions. So this really brings me uh, full circle um, to where I was at the very beginning of, of my talk in terms of talking about where we are and the fact that marriage and our freedom to talk about it, to live our lives according to that belief is at a crossroads. And it's really up to each and every one of us to decide whether or not we're gonna defend this vital institution. So I wanna challenge you tonight to think about what marriage is. I wanna challenge you to think about the arguments, think about the, the impact. You know, all of us have friends um, who we know who are gay and lesbian. We, we, we all have friends who, who are. But the, the, the long-term consequences and the unintended consequences are far bigger than, than these individual relationships. Because marriage has not only personal, obviously like familial impact, but it has societal impact. And so tonight, I would just ask each and every one of you and challenge you to, to engage on this issue and to, to consider um, stepping forward to defending uh, this institution. So a couple things that you can do to build a solid marriage culture, as well as safeguard other people's um, rights to speak clearly about it, um, is learn. Be equipped to speak out about it. Um, we've made that easy for you. There are um, brochures in the back that have a list of a lot of the questions. I'm sure a lot of you have either asked yourselves or been asked um, questions like, you know, why are you against equality? Um, the institution of marriage, like I mentioned earlier, is in disarray. What's the harm of, of allowing same-sex couples to marry? Um, am I on the wrong side of history? So I encourage you to pick up one of these brochures and, and read it and, and, and look at it with an open mind and open heart because there's a lot of valuable um, points in there about why marriage matters to our children and to family and to society. So in conclusion, I just want to say in summary that marriage is essential for our country to thrive and to flourish. And I encourage each and every one of you to consider the arguments. Be on the right side of history on this one so that one day a child won't come and look at you in the eye and ask you, why did you choose that I shouldn't have a mom? Why did you make the choice that I would never get to know my dad? So um, thank you so much for being here and I guess, oh, I'll let you come up. All right, thank you both for your words. I'm